May 18th, 2022 was the day that Masato Kinugawa, a renowned bug hunter, hacked the world's most valuable company, Microsoft. The service that he hacked was the social networking giant, Microsoft Teams. The severity of this bug was critical, as this was a remote code execution where attackers could escape the context of Teams and gain access to the underlying operating system without requiring so much as a single click from any of Teams' 270 million daily active users. Microsoft paid out an astronomical $150,000 bounty, placing this among the highest publicly reported payouts globally, and the largest bounty covered on this channel. This is also going to be the first exploit chain covered on this channel, which is in contrast to the previous single bug exploits. Before we can lay out the architecture of the exploit chain, we first need to understand Electron, the technology behind the Teams desktop application. Electron is a popular, open-source framework developed by GitHub that is designed for creating desktop applications using traditional web technologies such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Among the most well-known Electron desktop applications are Discord, Slack, VS Code, WhatsApp, and of course, Teams. Electron has two different types of processes, main and render. Each Electron app has a single main process running Node.js, which is logically equivalent to what the backend is in a traditional web app. With this comes any number of render processes, which are logically equivalent to front-end windows, which render HTML, CSS, and JavaScript using a version of the Chromium browser engine. Each visible window you see is running as a render process. The last thing that we need to understand are process models. Electron inherits its multi-process architecture from Chromium, which makes the framework architecturally very similar to a modern web browser. In the early days of the internet, browsers used a single process that was shared across all browser tabs. This means that the rendering of web pages, execution of JavaScript, and the overarching browser UI were all running within the same process. This had unwanted side effects, as a single website crashing or hanging would affect the entire browser. Even worse were the potential security risks, as web content had direct access to the entire browser process. To solve this problem, the Chrome team introduced the multi-process model, where each tab would render within its own process, with the overarching main process managing everything. This limits the harm that buggy or malicious code on a web page could cause to the browser as a whole. This is how Electron operates, with its main and render processes being analogous to Chrome's. Now that we're familiar with Electron at a high level, let's unveil the first exploit in the chain, which takes advantage of the chat feature within Microsoft Teams. The chat feature runs within a renderer process, mimicking the front end of a web app, which opens the door to cross-site scripting attacks. Through an elegantly crafted chat message, attackers enable themselves to execute arbitrary code within the chat window without requiring any clicks from the user. While a fully remote, zero-click, arbitrary code execution seems bad, the injected code is merely front-end JavaScript contained within the scope of the isolated and low-privileged renderer process. In order to cause any real harm, we would first need to escape out of the renderer process into the highly privileged main process, which has access to the incredibly powerful Node.js APIs. These include, among others, the API to execute operating system commands, which is how we could break out of the Teams application in its entirety and gain full system access. The second and third exploits in the chain accomplish this, but before we get ahead of ourselves, let's begin with stage one, cross-site scripting. If you're not familiar, cross-site scripting is a type of attack where malicious JavaScript is injected into trusted websites. The most basic example would be if someone wrote JavaScript within script tags on a video comment, and due to improper sanitization, everyone else viewing the comment would have their browser execute the malicious JavaScript. Of course, it's not going to be this easy, as Teams sanitizes all HTML content within chat messages. This sanitization is done at both server-side and client-side, with the client-side using an open-source library called Sanitize HTML. Here, we find an allow list that defines all the permitted class attributes for HTML sent within chat messages. Any other ones would be stripped out and discarded. Something interesting to note here is that the asterisks within the class attributes represent wildcards. This shouldn't be any cause for concern, as we still can't inject arbitrary elements or class names, but it does warrant further investigation. It turns out that any characters besides the class attribute separator itself, OX20, are allowed within this wildcard. This may seem like a dead end, however this is where AngularJS comes in. Angular is a client-side JavaScript framework that is used in some pages across Teams, including the chat page. Angular actually tends to be quite useful when it comes to cross-site scripting attacks, because arbitrary JavaScript can be executed within double curly brace template tags without the need for HTML script tags. You might be thinking that we could just place our JavaScript within a template tag for execution, however this is protected against and won't work. 
Something interesting to note is that a group of other security researchers in the past have actually achieved cross-site scripting attacks within teams by using a template string filter bypass, by inserting a null character between the curly braces. Of course this has been patched, but the fact that this was done in a single page app gives us hope that Teams dynamically compiles user input as AngularJS. But I digress, we need to be more creative, so let's go deeper. This is where the ng-init directive comes in. The ng-init attribute enables you to write JavaScript code within the attribute value itself, in the case that you wanted to initialize data before the template tags are evaluated, as we can see here. Of course, the ng-init attribute is not allow listed, meaning that we can't actually use it. Seems like another dead end, but we can go deeper. It turns out that in addition to using ng-init via regular attributes, it can be used as a class attribute as well. This increases our attack surface. Since AngularJS is open source, we can see exactly how it parses these classes, which is with this piece of regex. It turns out that there's actually no need for the ng-init class to be at the beginning of the string. All of these cases are valid and would be recognized by Angular. If you've been paying attention, you might be piecing together how we can pull off this attack. Let's take one of the allow listed classes, such as Swift Wildcard, and for the wildcard, let's insert our random character, delimit and begin a new class with a semicolon, define our ng init class, and then insert whatever malicious JavaScript code we want to be executed. This will pass right through sanitization as it conforms to the allow listed class while still being recognized, parsed, and executed by Angular. At this point, we have achieved a successful cross-site scripting attack with arbitrary JavaScript being executed within the renderer process through a chat message with zero clicks from the user. Let's move on to the next exploit in the chain to see how we can escape the context of the renderer process and gain access to Node's powerful APIs. Each renderer process window is created with an instance of the browse window class. These classes have three important security flags to consider, being node integration, sandbox, and context isolation. Node integration controls whether the renderer process has direct access to node APIs. If enabled, arbitrary JavaScript could directly call these APIs, causing a system-wide RCE. Needless to say, this was set to false. Before we get to the other two, let's take a quick digression to introduce preload scripts. As we know, the Electron main process runs a Node.js environment with full operating system access. The renderer processes, on the other hand, are fairly isolated and do not run Node.js. To bridge the gap and to enable inter-process communication, or IPC, we use preload scripts. Preload scripts are injected and ran within a renderer process before the web page itself loads in. Preload scripts have a higher privilege level than the renderer process and have access to Node.js APIs. Even if Node integration is enabled, the preload script will still have access to Node APIs as it is a privileged script. Sandboxing can be enabled in addition to Node integration, further enhancing security by enforcing a set of restrictions on the renderer process in a similar manner to Chromium sandboxes. Sandboxing will disable most of the powerful Node APIs within the preload script, however it will still have a subset of Node.js APIs available, predominantly for the purpose of inter-process communication. Within a sandbox, all privileged tasks, such as accessing the file system, cannot be done by the preload script anymore, and must be delegated to the main process via IPC. Sandboxing in this case was set to true. Context isolation is a feature that ensures that both your preload scripts and Electron's internal logic run in a separate context from the web content. This is important as it helps prevent websites accessing the powerful APIs that the preload script has access to. This was actually turned off, which is the crack in the dam that we needed. Despite the other two settings working against us, this was just enough to access the powerful node APIs with an exploit called Prototype Pollution. Prototypes are the mechanism by which JavaScript objects inherit features from one another. For instance, we can define a function called ocean that prints this is a clean ocean, and we can call it with its call method. We can now pollute the function prototype's call method by overriding it with this is a polluted ocean. The next time we call this function, or any other function within the same context, it will call the polluted version. Because context isolation is turned off, the JavaScript we injected into the renderer process with cross-site scripting shares the same context as its preload script, meaning the pollution will be global. We can go ahead and overwrite the call method with our injected code, and the next time a function is called with an object containing a node API from the preload script, we can steal the reference to this object, which contains a Node.js API that we shouldn't have access to. At this point, once we have the API reference, we can do whatever we want with it. 
You might be thinking that we're done, as we could use this API to run operating system commands, causing our RCE, right? We were so close, but the issue here is that sandboxing is enabled, meaning that all of the powerful APIs that the preload script should have access to, including the ability to execute OS commands, is disabled. We're only left with weaker APIs meant for IPC. In the course of testing which node objects would come up through the polluted function call, the bug hunter was able to steal a reference to the IPC renderer module. This is actually pretty useful, as the IPC renderer module is what's used for inter-process communication between the main and renderer processes. As we can see here, we can use it to send arbitrary code from the renderer process to the main process. The main process then receives it with an IPC handler. While we can't control what the main process does with the information we send it, we can hope that there's a handler on the main process with weak or improper validation that we can abuse, as the main process isn't affected by sandboxing and has full access to all of the Node.js APIs, which is how we could achieve our RCE. At this point, we injected JavaScript via cross-site scripting that was able to steal a reference to the IPC renderer, enabling us to send messages to the main process or other renderer processes, which is where the third exploit comes into play. It turns out that within Teams, there's an invisible renderer process called plugin host running in the background. Within the plugin host process, Sandbox is set to false, meaning that its preload script has full, unrestricted access to all Node.js APIs, unlike the chat window's preload script. Apparently, there is a node module called SlimCore loaded in, being operated from the main process via IPC. If you put a microscope under these IPC handlers, there's going to be three of them of interest to us. The IPC reference that we stole in Stage 2 can also be used to send messages to other renderer processes, including the invisible plugin host process. The messages that we send will be handled by these IPC handlers, which run within the privileged, unrestricted preload script. Let's see what we can do. Electron Remote Server Require calls require with the string specified in the payload. We have no other choice but to make this slim core, as validation allows only allow listed modules, but this won't stop us so easily. Electron Remote Server Member Get performs property access using the string specified in the payload. Here we can chain the dot two string and the dot constructor methods together in order to get the constructor for the two string method, which is the function constructor within JavaScript. Electron Remote Server Function Call performs a function call with the string specified in the payload. Up until this point, we have the JavaScript function constructor. We can go ahead and create a new function dynamically with whatever arbitrary JavaScript code that we want to execute. We can then use this same handler again, but with an empty string as the payload, to immediately call the function that we just defined. Now that we can execute arbitrary code within Plugin Host's preload script, we can use its privileged API access as our entry point to escape teams as a whole, achieving our system-wide RCE. In Masato's proof of concept, he would send the following HTML as a chat message, which would navigate to an attacker's website, where the JavaScript to both steal and use the IPC reference would be waiting, opening the calculator in this case, representative of an RCE. All of these exploits have been patched. Only a limited subset of characters are now allowed within the wildcard part of the allow listed classes. Context isolation is now enabled within the chat window, and CSP has been applied to preload scripts. If you want to stay protected from malware and other cyber threats, you might be interested in SquareX's newest addition to their free-to-use suite of privacy and security-driven tools, Malicious Document Detector. When it comes to email attachments, it's common for services like Gmail to scan incoming files, which may instill a sense of security among users, however the effectiveness of these measures has not been explicitly guaranteed by the providers themselves. For instance, we can embed a malicious macro into a Microsoft Office file, opening a .exe, and get a passing result. SquareX's new Scan for Malicious Documents feature is an industry-first, preemptive defense mechanism against office attachments. All detection happens locally within your own browser before you download the file. It provides a detailed list of the suspicious indicators, as well as the options to either strip out the malware, convert it into a secure PDF, or view it in their cloud-based disposable file viewer, maintaining the functionality of the macros within a controlled environment. This overcomes the limitations of conventional antivirus software, which often rely on heuristic rather than deterministic models. If you're interested in enhancing your security and anonymity online, click the link in the description to download the extension and start using SquareX for free today. If you're interested in more vulnerability breakdowns, check out these videos and subscribe to the channel for more content. Thanks for watching.